Greetings, epic adventure seekers. Welcome to your guide to demystifying your world. I'm Ali Bierman, and you are listening to Let's Get Metaphysical, Connecting Heart and Mind. If you've not yet done so, please rate and review our podcast so others can find it. And you can do that easily on my new website. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Dr. Gay Lang. Dr. Gay Lang is the light in the field of workplace diversity. Not just workplace, but workplace and in the world. And that includes diversity, inclusion, equity, tolerance, and training with 50 years of expertise in professional development and leadership. Dr. Gay Lang is the president and founder of Workplace Restorative Practices, Inc. She's well known as a leader in the field, having served as a White House appointee and author of the award winning book, Colorizing Restorative Justice, Voicing Our Realities, and the Amazon number one bestseller, Seven, which was just released in August 2021. She also hosts the Workplace Diversity podcast, which is all about inclusion equity, tolerance, and training. I highly recommend this eye-opening show. If you've lived your life kind of in a tower up on the hill, free from exclusion or inclusion, Dr. Gay and her guests will truly open your eyes. Dr. Lang is part of the movement training to overcome challenges, not through punishment, but through caring, understanding, through cooperation. But I'm going to let her tell you more about it. Do get comfortable, get a glass of water, and be prepared to listen really carefully. You just may experience a mind shift today. Before jumping in to our eye-opening chat, I want to remind you that your life isn't going to change unless you take steps to make a change. The special gift I have for you, and the link is in the show notes, Step in a New Direction, allows you to stop the insanity of doing the same things every day, expecting different results. That's not going to happen. And now it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Gay Lang. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our show. Oh, thank you so much, Allie. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited about today. Hopefully we'll have a great, great show. And I know with you as the host, we will. Thank you. I listen to your podcast and every episode is like, whoa. I didn't know about this. Why didn't I know about this? I think I know so much about the world and I don't. And if I, who's always studying something new, don't, well, no wonder the world is in the state it is. And it's a time for change and what better way for people to get involved. Please tell us, how did you get involved in the whole area of restorative justice and and the I also I looked at all your books on Amazon the restorative discipline just all these concepts what motivated you to get there well as an educator one of the things we do is work with students that may or may not have issues problems or concerns in schools and this is not just in the state I live in this is all over the United States discipline is a big issue so if we continue to discipline students the same way we're going to get the same results which is suspension expulsion from school in school suspensions out of school suspensions when students are away from school they're not learning anything if they're not learning anything they're not building themselves up to be better citizens or better students so i became involved to see if there was some way we can engage with students in a different way so that the relationship building part can be the catalyst to reduce the suspension so if i have a relationship with Allie. And good morning, Allie, how are you? I know Allie is my student. I care that Allie is okay. I'm asking Allie how she's doing. I know that she just got a pet. I know something about her. So it's more than just Allie, my student, 
A, B, C student, you're Allie, the person in my class that I really want to know. So if Allie does not do well today, I have a relationship that I can say, Allie, I'm so disappointed. Is there anything I can help you with today? If you don't feel like working, I get it, but let's try to keep it up. Because now I'm showing Allie that I'm best in her. I want her to be a better person and a better student. So instead of putting her out of my class because her head is down today, I may walk over and have a little chat. So that's more of a restorative model than a punitive model. And we're trying to move away from that in schools. And in terms of the book that I wrote, Colorizing Restorative Justice, Voicing Our Realities, that book was written as it relates to my career uh, in the workplace as a young teacher all the way through to my career to present day, all the things that I endured, all the uh, opportunities I had, some of the opportunities that were not there, some of the opportunities I made for myself, and just went forward no matter what. I pushed forward no matter what obstacles came in my way, whatever judgments came to me, I still pu pushed forward. And so I just wrote that chapter in the book to encourage other people who are in the workplace that are people of color, that you can, as an African-American or a Latino American, you can get promoted and you can work around the system that's trying to hold you back. So that's what the book was about. And that's one of the other places I kind of started considering restorative practices as a way of life. One of the many experiences in my life, um, for a little while, I was a substitute teacher in elementary school. And when I'd go into the classroom, there'd always be a note, right? These are the troublemakers. And I would take that list and I'd immediately create a relationship with those. You know, I'd ask them to do a special task. So I never had a problem with them, which is exactly what you saw when it was your career. And you were in a place where you were able to notice it and to notice what needs to be done. And I imagine that your students were welcoming the attention because why does somebody act out? Or maybe they have a problem at home. Maybe they're just tired or they're scared. Or as you know, there are all kinds of reasons yes, for behaviors. That's true. Mm -hmm. And if you don't ask, no one knows. True. And I think that part of the asking is the relationship building letting someone know that you do care about them and that their presence is important to you. And I think that we're trying to move away from that in education. I always ask myself and I ask people when I'm training, have you ever suspended a student because he couldn't write his name or because he didn't know his alphabet or because he couldn't read or because he couldn't do numbers? We don't suspend for that. We get tutoring. We help them practice. We work with them over and over again. We give them sheets to work on. We encourage them. But when it's time to ask them about discipline, we do not have a set way that we want them to behave in school. We assume they come to school with the social norms necessary to be in a classroom when they don't. So how about we teach you what we expect you to do in the class by building this relationship with you so that when you do have a bad day, you're more likely to say, Miss Allie, I'm having a bad day. Can I put my head down for five minutes? Or Miss Allie, can I go to the nurse without? I'm going. I don't want this. Or the teacher responding, well, get out of my class then. Not yeah. all teachers do that. But if we could reduce the number that are doing it, we'll help the ones that aren't doing it a whole bunch. Like every time I hear you speak, all these lights go off. Of what I'm awakening to. Uh, when I was a kid, I was like always the smartest person in school, and I couldn't understand how come some kids don't get it, or how come some kids are tired in school. And when I had a brain injury, so I couldn't do anything. And it's, I realized, oh my gosh, some people go through their whole life like this. And because it's an invisible injury, nobody knows. So it's like, I didn't give people the opportunities that I wish, looking back now, I could have. So I say thank you, thank you to all of you who are in action doing what you're doing, because it's obviously affecting not just in school, but in the world. And each life, we don't live in a vacuum. You touch one life, you're going to touch the family, the community. And I know that doesn't necessarily flow automatically, but if you don't start someplace, 
how are you going to get someplace else? That's true. I mean, you have to have a jump off point. There are a lot of teachers that are doing a great job. Get Don't get that wrong. I really believe that there are many educators doing it right, but there are not enough of us doing it right. And that's yes. that we need to get more people to do it. So if you only have three that are doing it or four, the other six needs to come on board or at least get six to four just to keep the numbers up of the positive energy, the, the really good things that are happening in education. We get... Uh, you know, a lot of black for not doing a great job, but when we do a great job, nobody highlights that quickly either. So I'm wow. trying to make sure that we do a good job, it's noticed, and that students are the real beneficiaries of our work. Wow. So I, I have a special needs grandchild and my daughter and son-in-law were very careful when they put pick the neighborhood to live in by picking the school. And she not only has extraordinary teachers and all the therapies in the classroom, but even the principal of the school is on board and she does phenomenally well and it's a public school. So there are definitely well, that's, places that's a like good that. testimony and there's lots of them. And even inside of a school, you may have a few bad apples as they say, but a lot of the teachers are working well. The idea is to make sure everyone is at least putting up the effort. Everyone is making sure every child feels valued, special, and that they belong, no matter what their set of circumstances are. Yeah. Yeah, this particular school, I think it was 17 different countries. It's a real mix of cultures in there, and that helps, too. Yes. I, I raised my kids in a D.C. area, and it was a very international area, and I, I'm pretty sure my kids were colorblind because their friends were all kinds of colors and all kinds of cultures. And th just to share a really quick story, I think my son was about nine. He was out for a walk with his dad and they saw two boys up on the hill and he said, that one there is my friend. And he thought for a, a moment, how am I going to differentiate my friend from the other kid? And he said, the one with the hat's my friend. And what my husband said was, one of them was black and one was white, and my son did not even see that. And that's that's the advantage of being in a neighborhood that's culturally diverse with schools that are culturally diverse. Well, you become accustomed to seeing different ethnic groups, different cultures, and engaging in a way that is positive versus negative. And so when it's a positive engagement or a positive interaction, the brain says it's great, it's okay. But when you begin to see it in a negative light, negative things happen then you, your brain starts picking apart every single thing because that's how the human brain works. Yes, the human brain works in very interesting ways. And the more that we know about it, the more we can assist people to go down the path that empowers them. Yes. Uh, I definitely have a whole lot more questions. I'm going to just take a quick sponsor break. When I was talking about the word awakening, being so commonly used in a very spiritual sense and it reminded me that what we awaken to is what we don't know we don't know and i have a very special offer for all of you my epic adventure seekers it's my most popular book what you don't know you don't know how your brain and mind keep you stuck but not just the book i also have an audio i made to go with it and there's a special deal you go down in the show notes today and take advantage of that book it was actually a bestseller for 15 months on amazon so there's definitely something maybe something for you in there and no going back would you please tell us the story of the book Seven? Oh, yeah. Seven is a book I wrote recently about women. They're African-American women. Their story is one of courage, bravery, and persistence. And it came, it's a historical fiction. It's built loosely around a sorority. And I say loosely because you can't use a sorority's name because I don't own it. But I did create the characters. The characters actually are my sisters. I have seven sisters. And each of the characters in that book has a personality similar to my sisters. And all of my sisters and myself were very strong women. So I just made the story up around them and embellished some of the things that happened at a, uh, historically uh, for African-American women. It was a white uh, campus and they became a sorority, but it took a lot of courage and perseverance despite 
the racism that existed at the time. And so they rose triumphant at the end of the story. So buy the book. You'll be really excited when you read the story. It's really entertaining. Going back to the whole concept of restorative justice and the workplace diversity. Wait a minute. Did I ask you to embellish about being a White House appointee? No. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to overlook that. Please explain Oh, that you don't us. have to worry about that. It's not <laughs> the end of the world. Well, um, for me, I, uh, I worked as secretary's regional representative for the U.S. Department of Education. I helped to manage five states with the U.S. Department of Education, wow. and that was Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and New Mexico. Wow. It was a big lift at the time. It was under No Child Left Behind, George W. Bush, and I was chosen to be a part of that team uh, to usher that out in the five states that I mentioned. And a lot of people did not quite understand what No Child Left Behind was. They just were opposing some things that they had no clue. Mm -hmm. But for the first time in our nation's history, education was a top priority and people were talking about it all over the place. That had never happened before. The reason they were talking about it because before then, if a school district or a classroom or a school had a state exam or a national exam and the scores were great and off the charts, when you disaggregated the data, it was the top 20% of that school that got those grades because they didn't test the rest of them. All students should be tested because all students you need to know. So, you know, what does Johnny know? Just because he's sitting in the back of the classroom quiet doesn't mean he's knowing anything. Or if he's absent from school and he never takes any tests, we don't even know if he made progress. So this No Child Left Behind said, well, let's look at everyone. Let's see how the special needs students are. Let's see how the special populations are going. Let's see how the bilingual students are going. Let's see how the low social. So let's, let's take a tally on everyone. And I think that that's the point people missed. It was more about making sure everyone was included. And that's why it was called No Child Left Behind. I'm just thinking the stage you mentioned that demographic, was it particularly challenging to, in, to support the program in that area? It wasn't any more challenging than anything else. It was the president's wish to do this. And it was, a, a, you know, the, the United States of America Department of Education said, this is what we're going to do. So, yeah, people might have not liked it some, some of the time, but they had to do it. It's called, do you want federal dollars or not? <laughs> that's, that's a choice. Oh, an interesting impact that had the school where my kids went and where I was a substitute teacher. I'm creative and I go in there and I want to have fun. And it's no, you have to stick to the curriculum and the curriculum is for passing the test. So I hope they don't still do that now. I think but, that people get that confused. They feel like you need to use the curriculum to pass the test. I'm going to object to that. And this is what I tell them. If you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. What you should be doing is equipping students to problem solve to pass any test. It could be the test for ya, yeah, ya, yeah, ya, yeah, ya, yeah, ya, yeah. text for ha, 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 ha. Can they think through the question enough to come up with the right answer? If not the right answer, a possible answer, so they can come up with the conclusion that this is what has to happen. So we should be preparing, preparing students to think through the system of testing, not practice how to test and then give them the test. Everyone in the country that drives has a driver's license. If you don't, you shouldn't be driving. But every state has a driver's license test. And how do you know what's on the test? There's a little booklet with the little green and red and yellow lights on the front of it. And they tell you, these are the questions that we're going to be asking on the test. This is how it's going to look. So there's this gentleman called Fenwick English. He's a professor. He said that if you align what is taught, the teaching part, against what you expect them to do, the testing part, when you align what is teach, what, what you're teaching against what is tested, you're going to get an excellent result. So if I align my testing model, if the model is you have circles, dots, and squares, and this is how the answer is going to look. Well, I'm going to make sure my students know what the circle dots and squares are. More importantly, how to choose the right one, because I'm going to help them think through that process. So 
It's not teaching the test. It should be teaching ways to solve problems in any test. And I think people like to find a way to just say, well, no, it's teaching the test. But if you're doing that, you are doing it wrong. You should be teaching them to problem solve any test. That's, I'm so grateful that you said that because I totally believe that. I had a professor in college who, when you took his tests, you not only had to answer the questions, you had to quote his exact words from the class or you couldn't get higher than a C. And I thought, it's just an ego trip for him. He's not interested in what we're learning. So, I, and I think there are a lot more teachers out there today, or at least I'm seeing that with my grandchildren, who are teaching from their heart and they really care about what they're doing. And it's not just a job, but it's a place they want to be. And to get support from the school system, that's going to make all the difference. Yes. And I think that that's important. If we're going to do a good job of educating, we have to be able to do it in a way that everyone is involved, everyone is included, and everyone has an opportunity to learn. And no child is perfect, but no teacher is perfect either. So it will take some time on everybody's end, some patience, some understanding, and some willingness to have some growth mindsets to make a difference. How do you see the um, restorative justice in the workplace? Um, for me, that's why I wrote the book a chapter in the book on colorized and restorative justice. And by the way, you can pick that up on Living Justice Press. Uh, they're selling the book and it's also on Amazon. But nonetheless, I try to use restorative practices. And I say restorative practices because they're tools. So if I have a relationship building tool in my purse that I could use or in my back pocket or in my head, when I have a conflict at work, instead of getting upset with my boss, or alleging he doesn't like me or whatever, at least I wanna have an opportunity to express myself. So if you've hurt me, harmed me, caused me discomfort, allow me the opportunity to share with you my feelings. I am not blaming you for anything, Allie. I'm saying this is how I felt when this happened. And it's up to you to say, I understand what happened. I was feeling this. If each person owns their own feelings, that they bring to the table. And here's the other person's feelings. Solutions come much easier than pointing the finger. You said this about me and then you did that. Well, pretty soon you're arguing. That's not what it's about. It's more about what am I feeling at the moment? What did I feel at the moment? How was I heard about this situation? And how, how do I need to move forward with you? Or how can I repair this damage? That's incredible because I've written a number of relationship books and you just defined how to have a successful relationship of any kind, including your marriage. Oh, yes. Trust me, it works in marriages, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you know, the saying how you do anything is how you do everything. And I think people don't realize that. And I've bounced in and out of so many relationship groups on Facebook and all people want to do is complain about their partner. And nobody wants to take any responsibility because nobody's doing exactly what you just described. And it's, it's the only way you're going to get through it is by assisting each other and that you do by understanding where the other person's coming from. So yeah, I could put the marriage counselors out of business, I think, just, <laughs> just practicing that kind of communication. You know, my latest relationship book, I have two whole chapters on communication, how to talk so somebody will listen, how to listen so somebody will talk. And it's, it isn't, unfortunately, it's not straightforward because we aren't taught those skills when we're growing up. So I, I think that's phenomenal that you can go in and train in such a way that adults can take it in and make the change. Well, you could avoid lawsuits if you did. Think about all the harassment suits at work. Oh. He said this. He doesn't like me. He, he didn't evaluate me fairly. Uh, he passed me up. He didn't promote me. So when you have good conversation and good relationships, there's no... Favoritism is more about treating you fairly, just as I would treat anyone else. 
And then that way you don't have the opportunity to say I have done some wrong to you because I'm being very clear about my expectations. I'm being very clear about how I'm going to support you. I'm being very clear if there's an incident to please get back with me. And I'm being very clear that I have an opportunity to explain myself and you could explain yourself without being angry. We just need to come to the table and see what that looks like and how does that play out and what can we do to make it better moving forward. And I think that workplace restorative practices and diversity is more than just checking the box that I had diversity training. Diversity training doesn't do anything. It just mm -hmm. says you got uh, one of every group, every ethnic group or every racial group in your group. So that doesn't mean anything. Are you inclusive? Right. Are you intolerant up there? Are you, are you try trying to train and tolerate? Are you trying to understand? Are you trying to be, you're trying to give equity? Does everybody have an opportunity to apply for that job and get an interview? Or is just a chosen few? Or are you only choosing the same people all the time to promote? What does that really look like in the workplace? And I think people think because they have diversity training and they check a box off, diversity training, let me repeat it, diversity training where you check the box, you're good, you're not. You didn't do anything but show up and check a box. You didn't do anything to change the dynamics of what's happening. That's phenomenal. How can we, um, as a community, participate and help educate, help spread the word of everything that you've been talking about? I mean, most people say, yeah, I care, but they're just doing lip service. But are there actual steps that you can recommend to us? I think that as an individual, each person is responsible for their own behavior and their own actions. Nobody can make you do anything. You have to want that. That's the first part. Number two, once you choose to do something different or choose to, to be in relationships, try to have a relationship with someone that is authentic as possible. Don't say, well, I want to have a relationship with the Hispanic group. I want to have a relationship with the African-American. I think I might have a white friend. It's not about that. Do you really want to know the person in a way that is professional? If it's at the job and respectful at the job and appreciated at the job without intruding in somebody's space intentionally. How you might do that is at your workplace if you have affinity groups. Affinity groups are like-minded people like-minded, not only like-minded, might be all African-Americans first. And then maybe after the African-Americans have a meeting, they invite some other groups in to get to know about them or they could get to know about us. Lunchtime meetings. Let's just have a lunchtime uh, group meeting with African-Americans. And then next week, it'll be the Hispanic. And then the next week, we bring both groups together and say, so what's some things you talk, you know, in your culture that you, you're celebrating? What are some of the things you want to talk about? Just Keep it simple. Start off with small things like lunch group meetings, small law, small things to maybe have small affinity groups, then bring the larger group together. Because the first thing, people need to be able to have a space. People need a safe place to speak if you're a person mm -hmm. of African-American descent. They may not feel safe to say that in a public way at work. Wow. But if they say it to their affinity group, discuss then when they finish, they may have a better way to present it without being upset or angry. Same thing for the Hispanics or Asians or any group. When you have an affinity group, it means my group is meeting to hash out our problems and how we feel in a way that is private so we don't feel like we're threatened or intimidated. And then if we want to talk about it in the larger group, we have a platform to do it and we have a way to get the word out to how we feel. And then there's no anger of we didn't get a chance to talk. Y'all always talk. Try to find a way to do small groups first. Start out small. And as you start small, it'll get better over time and people will begin to open up because they know that change is happening. They want to be a part of it. They're positive. So. So on that note, is there a special message that you'd like to leave with our listeners? So my message for your listeners is this. We are all human beings, regardless of the color of our skin. And yes, that's very trite, the color of our skin and all that, the content of our character. But if we can appreciate people for what they bring to the table, whatever that something is, whatever their gift, their talent, their special, whatever that they want to offer, that can help or help someone else understand them. That's important. Now, whether you appreciate it or not, or think it's important to you or not, if you did no more than listen, 
and say nothing. Try not to judge people so quickly. Everybody has mistakes they make. Everyone is shame of things they've done. Give them everybody a, 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 the benefit of the doubt. If we can learn to forgive as quickly as we judge, things will be a whole lot different in the world. That's really, really powerful. What is the best way for people to get in touch with you? And uh, I also, I was all over your website too, and I saw the gift that you have for, if you want to just mention that. Three R's of workplace diversity, and it's a free handout that you can get on my website. And my website is www.workplacerestorativepracticesinc.com, and they will be in the show notes as well. And you could also order the books off of Amazon. Uh, and the books are also on my webpage. And my podcast is there as well. So I hope everyone take a look at the webpage, go and get your free download and enjoy the reading. And I thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for the work that you do, for being so articulate so that we can understand what you're saying about everything and comprehend it. And I can't recommend highly enough. Please, everybody, check out all the links that you're going to see in the show notes because it will be part of your awakening. Now, remember to join our Facebook group where you can make new friends. And I would love to hear your reactions when this episode goes live. I'd like to know what new idea that you got or what thought you hadn't thought of before how did this impact you and you can do that the link below for joining our facebook group and also the link to our new website where it's really really easy for you to leave a review and i wish you a week filled with blessings thank you for having me on your show thanks again <laughs>